Mr. We have a treat for you. Dr. Lauren Kajawaka um, is a music scholar who focuses on the intersection of hip hop and music teaching uh, principles. Um, he does pedagogical investigation as well as empirical and analytical work to that extent. Uh, I first encountered Lauren's work uh, in a book that was reviewed by someone that we at GW recently encountered, uh, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, called Seeing Race Again. Um, I read the book uh, as I am a scholar of critical race theory as well, and I was delighted to see uh, Lauren's ch book chapter in there. So, you know, I called him up, we had a Zoom conversation, and he said, well, you know, the book chapter is great, and we did send that out, and we hope you review, but I've got another paper that I'm uh, about to publish that I would like to get feedback on. Can I have some time to have a presentation that kind of combines those two concepts? And, of course, we at GSHED said yes, um, and that is the production of what we're having today. Thank you, Lauren, for this presentation. Th thanks so much. Um... And, and thanks so much to, to Dr. Wright for inviting me and, and taking an interest um, in my work. Um, you know, it's like we, you know, as scholars, we publish things and they go out there and then you, you wonder who's reading them. And um, there's no better feeling um, than getting an email that you weren't expecting from somebody um, saying that they read your stuff and, and they want to talk about it. So um, it's been great um, getting to meet you. I hope to meet you in person one day. It's like, you know, we've got we've gotten a chance to talk and it's all been it's been virtual, so um, I look forward to that day. Um, thank you to those of you that are that have, have logged in and, and joined us this morning. Um, I do want to um, let you know that, like the talk that I'm giving today, is based on a forthcoming article in the journal Twentieth Century Music, and I have permission from the journal to share um, the proof version of the article, which I pasted a link to uh, in the chat. So, if you are interested in uh, downloading that and reading more, um, reading sort of the full version of what I'm presenting today, please please do so. Um, also, wanted to just say that this is a talk that I've only given to you know, musicologists and, you know, music theorists and people who, who teach and research about music. Um, and it's very specific to the field of music, but I very much, um, you know, do think that, that it probably overlaps and, 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 and um, has themes that um, no matter what disciplinary background you're coming from, you might be able to relate to. So the thing that I'm interested in today is learning from, you know, attendees, uh, from their questions, from their comments uh, at the conclusion of this talk, about how the things I'm I'm um, sharing with you today about music might relate to um, you know parallel or very similar things that you encounter um, in your work. All right. So without further ado, I'm I'm going to get into it. Um, the plan is to talk for about 35 minutes or so, and then we'll we'll open it up for questions. And I really look forward to that discussion. So. This past summer, um, I had the opportunity to teach a, a hip hop history course through the summer session, and it was offered online, of course, due to COVID-19. Um, and during week two of that term, um, the video of white Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, um, you know, kneeling on the neck of, of George Floyd and, and killing him was broadcast widely through news and social media. And this, of course, sparked national and, and international protests against police brutality. Um, many of my students who were enrolled in that summer class participated directly in those protests um, that were occurring in their respective communities, and they told me repeatedly how the music from our course seemed directly related to current events. Uh, our unit on NWA and West Coast gangster rap, for example, delved into the United States war on drugs and its effect on policing and mass incarceration, issues that are central to the Black Lives Matter movement's call to defund the police. Students learned about the Los Angeles Police Department's infamous Batarang, uh, which was immortalized in song by the rapper Toddy T, and how this armored vehicle symbolized the growing militarization of police forces, the effects of which we see confronting today's protesters. The same week that we read Robin D.G. Kelly's essay on how gangster rappers use beats and rhymes to fire back symbolically at state authorities, protesters in Minneapolis blasted Lil Boozy's Fuck the Police over loudspeakers while facing off with uh, the Minneapolis Police Department at the 3rd Precinct. I wanted to feel some satisfaction about the relevance of my teaching uh, at this particular moment, especially as students excitedly shared new tracks with me by their favorite artists critiquing racism and supporting the protesters. Instead, however, 
Floyd's killing and the growing and growing calls to address racism, not just in policing, but in all facets of American life, forced me to reflect on my role as a teacher and scholar of hip hop. In years past, I've said the names Trayvon Martin, Renisha McBride, Michael Brown, Jordan Davis, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, and other Black victims of racist violence in my classes. But does researching and teaching about Black music do anything to combat racism? Is the effort I put into preparing my lectures or the respect that I show for Black musicians in my courses a valid response to the ongoing destruction of Black life? As musicologist William Chang warns, celebra celebrating Black resiliency to racism in music, such as hip hop, can have the double-edged effect of naturalizing Black suffering and oppression. In fact, I was disturbed by how easily the slides that I created in the wake of Michael Brown's 2014 killing and the subsequent Ferguson uprising could be recycled for use at the present moment, leaving me to wonder if, my if one of my main roles at the university is to teach mostly white, mostly middle-class students how to intelligently consume Black pain. This lecture is in part an effort to address uh, what Saidiya Hartman has described as the translation of Black suffering into white pedagogy. Thus, I seek answers to three interrelated questions. First, uh, what can the incorporation of hip hop teach us about the challenges of diversity in music departments primarily devoted to the study and performance of Western classical music? Second, can popular music studies, uh, I'm sorry, second, uh, does the work of non-Black scholars who write about music made by Black bodies contribute to the freeing of those bodies or merely represent yet another way they are consumed by white supremacy? And third, can popular music studies help to overcome ongoing racial inequality within schools and departments of music? These questions are critical because the last two decades have witnessed a dramatic rise in dissertations, theses, and other academic publications exploring hip hop music, while college courses on hip hop history have become commonplace. And although it's nice to see more music scholars as excited about NAS and the notorious BIG as they are about Bach and Beethoven, those of us hoping to address racial inequality in music departments can't expect an increased familiarity with black cultural production to stand in for racial progress. Um, as hip hop historian and political activist Jeff Chang explains, the growing prominence of racialized entertainment and people of color featured in advertising often presents the look of multiculturalism without any corresponding commitment to social justice. Similarly, the growing prominence of hip hop music in our curriculum and research agendas doesn't necessarily make the study of music at colleges and universities more inclusive. Uh, these issues are, ex are, are especially acute for those of us who teach and research hip hop in musicology and music theory, um, which are disciplines that I, I have like a, a profound scarcity of black voices. In fact, I, I vividly remember um, about 10 years ago um, before a, a national conference meeting in San Francisco, um, a widely read musicology blog that kind of focused on humorous takes on our, on our discipline posted a conference bingo card. And one of the boxes on the bingo card read, all white hip hop panel. Um, more recently, at the joint meeting of the American Musicological Society and the Society for Music Theory, uh, which took place in San Antonio, Texas in 2018, um, there was a session devoted to the future of hip hop studies that didn't feature any black speakers. And Lauren Kerr, the session's chair, recognized this problem and addressed it directly in her presentation, noting, quote, as hip hop scholars, we're celebrating the increased presence and visibility of scholarship on black music uh, in our societies. And yet we continue to have these largely, if not entirely white panels. Uh, she therefore encouraged other non-black hip hop scholars to quote, consider how our ap approaches to scholarship might be contributing to the marginalization of black scholars as well as blackness in our work. Are we erasing blackness in our academic discussions of hip hop, especially when discussing the music, end quote. I fear the answer to Kara's question is too often yes. And as I'm about to explain, uh, the incorporation of hip hop studies into US music departments threatens to shore up the value of whiteness in those same institutions. In order to understand this paradox, how the incorporation of black music could reinforce whiteness, we have to examine the racial economy of music departments in, the age of, in, in an age of so-called diversity and inclusion. Uh, in the last few decades, 
music schools have attempted to become more diverse through initiatives designed to broaden their curricula and attract underrepresented students. Hoping to increase ethnic and racial minority representation uh, and to avoid being left behind by other departments on campus offering competing courses on popular music, um, faculty members and administrators have added new courses on previously marginalized topics, including hip hop. These changes, though positive in some respects, haven't yet stimulated a widespread reevaluation of institutional priorities and commitments. Although most campuses now offer courses exploring the history and cultural dynamics of diverse musical forms from around the world, such coursework tends to be elective or geared towards fulfilling the general education requirements of non-majors. In other words, these courses are not even, uh, oh, in some cases, these courses aren't even open to music majors, or if they are, they don't satisfy any music degree requirements. In other words, music departments have been slow to change their core curricula, the part that formed the foundation of the study for, of performance, history, theory, and ensemble work. Uh, as I've argued elsewhere um, in the chapter that, that Professor Wright shared with everyone, um, these dynamics reflect a deeply held possessive investment in Western classical music that allows colleges and universities to exploit student interest in popular music to subsidize classical music instruction. Uh, under financial pressure to pay for the small class sizes and one-on-one -on -one instruction demanded by conservatory style uh, music lessons, many schools have turned to large general education classes on rock and roll, hip hop, and other popular music genres to fund studio lessons and ensemble instruction. Even in cases where tuition dollars aren't tied directly to enrollment numbers, the division persists with comprehensive education in classical music on the one hand and a smattering of general education courses covering popular music history on the other. In this way, even curricular changes that appear to redress past exclusions can find themselves co-opted to preserve the status quo. In his article, Music Theory and the White Racial Frame, uh, Philip Ewell takes aim at music theory's single-minded focus on the music and ideas of white men, detailing the ways that, their, that um, music theory supports a racially exclusive curriculum that marginalizes women and people of color. Despite a glaring lack of diversity uh, in just about every respect, music theorists and musicologists rarely discuss the essential knowledge of their field in racial terms. Uh, colorblind standards of, race, uh, of research objectivity and authority allow white supremacist assumptions about what counts as legitimate music to be baked into the foundation of our field. Now, Ewell's target is understandably um, the all-white male canon of composers and music theorists. Um, you can think, you know, Bach, Beethoven, so on and so forth. Um, and his critique naturally provoked an angry response from some senior scholars that are committed to, um, you know, those, those composers and analyzing them um, using the work of, of white music theorists. Um, the defensive posturing and attacks that Ewell received, he, I mean, he, he received a lot of support, but also you know, um, some very angry responses and um, even an, an issue of a journal uh, called the Journal of Shankarian Studies, uh, where some senior scholars attacked him, you know, personally and, and um, you know, kind of attempted to discredit his work. Um, and I think the, the thing that I find interesting about this is that the folks who were attacking him, um, you know, were, were, were condemned by a number of music theorists and musicologists who rose to Ewell's defense. And I found that to be really, really heartening. Um, but in some ways, the folks who were attacking him were, were sort of easy targets. And, and, I, and it left me wondering about the music theorists and musicologists who don't work on canonical composers, right? Who might work on, on, on black music, for example, um, and who don't use like m the methods of music theory that, that uh, Yule is critiquing in, in this article. Like what about the folks who are starting to move into new territory on, on especially on black music? So consider, for example, uh, the growing list of publications uh, by music theorists who are writing about hip hop. Uh, their work has focused attention on black artists and given their colleagues and students an opportunity to closely examine musical forms that many music theorists once considered unworthy of study. Um, at the same time, however, because the discipline is, you know, has what Philip Ewell calls this white racial frame, this conversation, this emerging scholarly conversation on hip hop ha has consisted largely of white men talking to other white men. And I don't think the statement is surprising or controversial. As Ewell himself notes, 
music theory remains a field overrepresented by white men. Um, the privileging of Western classical music that's enforced by accrediting bodies such as the National Association of Schools of Music uh, means that gaining entrance into master's and PhD programs in music history and in music theory uh, is often predicated on students' familiarity with and expertise in classical music. Uh, in other words, like most musicology and theory departments are housed within academic units that regard instruction in classical music performance as their main purpose. So any graduate students that are admitted are expected to serve as teaching assistants in an undergraduate curriculum, right? In music history, music theory, and musicianship that centers Western classical music. Um, and you will also point out that PhD programs in music theory routinely require core seminars, such as the history of theory, Shankarian analysis, and post-tonal analysis that focus exclusively on the work of white men. Similarly, in many PhD programs in musicology, comprehensive exams focused almost single-mindedly on the history of Western classical music, and foreign language requirements continue to privilege German, French, and Italian. In other words, I mean, this is like the big point here, earning the privilege, right? Earning the privilege to write about black music as a music theorist or as a musicologist paradoxically requires possessing greater familiarity with the music and ideas of white men. This system allows for new knowledge to be generated about black music without a corresponding inclusion of black voices. The numerous required seminars devoted to Western music theory, history and analysis reinforce the expectation that even research on hip hop should be accountable first and foremost to other white music theory scholars. And I'm concerned about the way that scholars writing about hip hop from music disciplinary backgrounds are therefore inclined to create their own separate discourse about hip hop without engaging black voices that are considered to be outside of their discipline. Um, so the problem is not that the work of, the, uh, of white scholars analyzing hip hop is wrong per se. It's not like um, you know, this problem can be solved by pointing out how um, you know, the way like their, their specific analysis and, and the points that they're making about the music are, are, are wrong. Um, it's that the discipline in which they're trained and in which they seek employment is encouraging them to ignore the work of black scholars in favor of their own discipline's ideal of what counts as analytical rigor. Uh, as Kimberly Crenshaw and, and other critical race scholars explain, colorblindness in academia reproduces its own appeal by limiting the means by which countervailing information is legitimately produced. In music theory, this means rewarding work that focuses on formal relationships, um, that is like sort of just the music itself, without getting distracted by things that are considered to be extra musical concerns. Um, so in other words, we're talking about um, a commitment to insights that are drawn from the rigorous study of, of musical texts, um, and that's what forms the basis of how knowledge is generated in the field. Um, reinforcing this idea that a, a musical work's aesthetic significance can be determined from its formal properties alone without having to consider, uh, and, and this is really like a, a race neutral orientation that's far removed from you know, the work of uh, in, in the interdisciplinary world of hip hop studies where blackness and questions of social justice remain central concerns. Um, other musicologists, uh, most notably um, the feminist, famous feminist musicologist Susan McClary, have long criticized music theory's orientation towards the music itself. Uh, and she's warned music theorists against this false binary between objective and subjective uh, modes of analysis that lead many to ignore music's relationship with human experience and with cultural history. But the growth of hip hop as a study of field uh, the growth of hip hop as an object of study in a field dominated by white men provides a new window, window into how the discipline's formalist commitments constitute a politics of race. Um, philosophers who are critical of their own disciplines, white male bias, have coined the phrase epistemology of ignorance to describe the practice of pursuing knowledge while excluding as beyond its purview, the lived experiences and concerns of women racial minorities, LGBTQ people, and others unable or unwilling to adopt uh, the, pr the privileged position of a white hetero male subject. As philosopher and popular music scholar Robin James notes, by separating analysis from history and ethnography, music theory, much like modern analytic philosophy, naturalizes the common sense intuitions of the most privileged members of society as objective knowledge. So in music theory, 
Discipline authority itself derives from quasi-scientific methods that limit research goals to modeling how music works, uh, arguably or presumably for ideal white male listener, listeners. Music theorists' focus on these formal relationships might enable a level of analytical detail not found in the work of other scholars, uh, but it does so at the expense of entire worlds of knowledge about what makes hip hop such a vital and important part of our contemporary world. Sheltered from the many conversations already underway about rap's social, political, and artistic uh, dimensions, music departments offer the safest spaces on campus for white men to talk about hip hop. These practices silence the voices of black hip hop scholars, even those who've contributed uh, theoretical arguments about hip hop music. In fact, if we go all the way back to, you know, this found, you know, 1994, uh, Trisha Rose's Black Noise, Rap Music and Black Culture in Contemporary America, which is the first, you know, academic book length study on hip hop, uh, Rose devotes an entire chapter to exploring hip hop's musical properties. And particularly, uh, she, she calls attention to repetition, which unites rap with other groove-based Afro-diasporic forms like funk and reggae, and differentiates it from Western classical music's goal-directed drive. Uh, she contrasts rhythm in Western classical music, which serves to support the way tonal structures are organized uh, teleologically, which is to say towards a specific goal or destination, uh, to the way that rhythm functions as a structural element in hip hop beats through repetition. Two decades later, uh, in a chapter devoted to the musical analysis of rap in the Cambridge Companion to Hip Hop, um, white music theorist Kyle Adams repeated these observations about rhythm and repetition and compared Western classical music to rap. But he did so without citing Trisha Rose. To me, this omission speaks to the way that citational practices silence and exclude Black women scholars because they're not considered theorists. Uh, as, as Philip Ewell, uh, who I mentioned earlier, notes, what counts as theory and who counts as theorists are not questions that can be easily disentangled from the discipline's history of racial exclusion. Drawing on Sarah Ahmed's critique of cultural theory, Ewell discusses how citational chains become ways of marginalizing non-white and female voices. Since Rose is not known as a music theorist in a strict disciplinary sense, and because she's a woman of color writing about issues of race, her work lies beyond uh, the, the sources needing consultation uh, and, and deference. In, in, her, in his chapter, for example, Adams defines hip hop analysis as, quote, the usual music theoretical sense of manipulating notes, rhythms, and so forth in order to reveal something about the inner workings of a piece of music, end quote. By limiting their scope of study to hip hop's so-called inner workings, Adams and other music theorists exclude, exclude perspectives from interdisciplinary studies that might challenge or complicate their analysis, upholding the field's race-neutral status quo, even as they incorporate discussions of Black music. I don't mean to suggest that the problem I've been discussing can be resolved simply by adding a few footnotes, but I chose to include this example because it raises important questions for hip-hop studies in music theory and musicology. Um, such as whose music and methods of analysis deserve attention? Who counts as a theorist, musicologist, or composer? From where do legitimate conversations about music originate, and whose purposes do they serve? Rose's work should be essential to music theorists because she theorizes rap music. The observations she makes about hip-hop's aesthetics are intimately tied to post-industrialism, U.S. racial and sexual policy, a uh, politics, and various media and institutional responses to black culture, topics that should be relevant to anyone attempting to analyze rap music. Rather than excluding such concerns, music theorists should imagine how analysis of hip hop would look if Rose and other women of color were considered foundational sources in their field. I've raised these concerns about music theory and hip hop to encourage all music scholars to think more deeply about how we address the exclusion of black people in our work. Um, although musicologists writing about hip hop might have a better track record of engaging interdisciplinary scholarship uh, by, art, by authors of color, the truth is that musicologists and music theorists most often work together within the same music departments upholding a white-centered culture and curriculum. One of the biggest questions facing musicology and music theory, I believe, is whether the growing prominence of hip hop as a legitimate area of study and, and a legitimate area of teaching 
will transform the disciplines within which, within which we work, or will it reinforce exclusionary patterns that, 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 that have existed for decades? Um, in his 2001 article, Who Hears Here? Black Music, Critical Bias, and the Musicological Skin Trade, um, African-American musicologist Guthrie Ramsey Jr. expresses his concern that without the participation of African-American scholars and critical perspectives that they bring to the table, musicological studies of Black music will remain locked in a familiar pattern. Quoting the words of literary scholar Anne DeSill, uh, Ramsey suggests that Black music is, quote, more easily intellectualized and canonized when transferred from the danger of lived Black experience to the safety of white metaphor, when you can have that signifying Black difference without the difference of significant Blackness. Those of us engaged in bringing hip hop into music departments need to be asking ourselves whether our modes of hearing, writing, and interpreting might be generating knowledge about Black music while, simulti while simultaneously excluding Black people. Simply put, I think my own path to becoming a professor who was lucky enough to teach and research hip hop was cleared by the disenfranchisement of Black people. There's simply no other explanation for the scarcity of Black musicians and historians in music departments across the country. In fact, the exclusion of Black music and Black people uh, in, and Black scholars from musicology has probably made it easier for me to be regarded as an expert. As the first tenure-track Asian-American musicologist to be hired in the two departments where I've worked, I'm certain that my presence has helped give the impression of greater diversity without increasing the presence of Black faculty members. In a similar way, new courses on hip hop might help departments achieve the look of musical diversity without fundamentally altering core practices. Although fighting for the inclusion of hip hop um, in schools of music is a step in the right direction, if we don't simultaneously challenge institutional uh, and disciplinary norms, hip hop's presence is gonna get managed in ways that preserve the status quo. Thus, I think it's imperative for musicologists and music theorists to work together and to align themselves with critical race scholars and activists seeking structural change. Uh, black folklorist Langston Colin Wilkins offers an incisive analysis of how black culture is incorporated into white controlled academic and nonprofit organizations and his reflections on this topic are worth quoting at length. He says, personally, I find it pretty wild that engaging black culture too often involves strategically navigating whiteness. We operate in a system where white gatekeepers present black culture for the white gaze. Black cultural spaces exist in isolation until they produce something that white people desire. White people rarely enter them until there's something they want to enjoy and, and eventually control. They exploit structural inequalities by using their capital, connections, and other resources like grants and philanthropic culture to control artists and art forms. They become gatekeepers. Sometimes they're scholars, uh, experts, agents, managers, documentarians, or nonprofit heads. Access goes through them. They create organizations for these traditions and then only hire other white people. Imagine being black and having to navigate white folks to engage something that emerged from your community. Imagine some white guy vetting you for access to your kinfolk. This is a process of cultural extraction. White gatekeepers use their resources to present these black traditions to moneyed white audiences. They present performances, showcases, and symposiums in spaces far removed from the black community. And it's not that there's a lack of spaces in the black community, it's because the cultural sector is dependent on the white gaze. The goal is to bring the margins to the mainstream because the mainstream won't go to the margins. The processes of white gatekeeping and cultural extraction perpetuate severe inequalities. Sure, these white-led organizations may have diverse programming, but it means very little to me if black folks and other people of color have little access to it. Black-led organizations are resilient, but bending but not breaking is woefully unhealthy. Black culture workers struggle to find any sort of balance between cultural respect, personal fulfillment, and financial stability. It's a dirty structure that needs to be destroyed and rebuilt. One way that popular music scholars, especially those with tenure, might be able to help rebuild our disciplines is to help broaden what's considered significant, meaning tenure-worthy scholarship. Musicologist Mark Katz, who's created opportunities for hip hop DJs, MCs, and producers to teach at the University of North Carolina's music department, writes about how universities need to treat hip hop artists more fairly. Too often, he explains, we invite them to campus without paying them, and no matter, um, and no matter how qualified they are, it's nearly impossible for them to teach 
as official faculty members due to institutional guidelines about who can be listed as an instructor of record. Quote, he, he says, quote, why is having a master's degree sufficient to teach hip hop, but having Grammys and platinum records and decades of relevant experience is not, end quote. As Katz suggests, one way of transforming our discipline is through forging truly collaborative and respectful relationships with the people who make the music we are so intent on studying. Um, in an article about his experiences bringing uh, Puerto Rican bomba, which is a close relative uh, to, uh, of hip hop culture to the University of Washington School of Music, ethnomusicologist Shannon Dudley offers further insight into how fostering new relationships with musical communities can help transform uh, academic enterprises. As Dudley notes, bomba's combination of music, dance, poetry, community building, and social activism necessitates a rethinking of traditional disciplinary boundaries and desired outcomes. He outlines the way that Bomba's community music orientation offers a more inclusive alternative to the Western classical world's more individualistic emphasis. Drawing on the work of Chicana musician and feminist music theorist Martha Gonzalez, who has taken a similar approach to incorporating uh, fandango, uh, jarocho music uh, from Veracruz into college settings, Dudley encourages music programs to build participatory music experiences into degree requirements, hire visiting artists, partner with community artists and groups, and collaborate more with other disciplines and academic units outside of music. At the same time, he recognizes the importance of documenting the impact uh, of, of these kinds of activities, uh, the, the impact that they have on student learning, community engagement, et cetera, um, in order to revise the hiring and promotion criteria to support faculty who want to do collaborative community-based work. These recommend recommendations about academic standards are key uh, because many junior faculty and graduate students want to create change but feel pressure to demonstrate their accomplishments in ways that are legible to the experts that confer degree, uh, accept articles for publications, and award tenure. As, as Guthrie Ramsey notes, quote, while it may be true that the leadership and the rank and file of our professional music societies have remained committed to the ideal of cultural diversity, true diversity will mean a change in what counts as valuable knowledge in our professional discourse. New criticisms demand new attitudes, end quote. One of the best examples of what it might mean for hip hop to bring new attitudes and new forms of knowledge into music departments uh, is the work of A.D. Carson, who is the assistant professor of hip hop in the global south at the University of Virginia's uh, music department. Um, Carson gained notoriety in 2017 after completing a PhD in rhetoric at Clemson University by writing and recording a rap album in place of a traditional dissertation. Not only did this innovative decision become the subject of social media controversy, but Carson's lyrics for one track uh, called See the Stripes which invoked Clemson University's tiger mascot to highlight aspects of the school's involving uh, aspects of the school's history involving slavery, sharecropping, and convict labor, set off a backlash uh, that brought the then PhD candidate hate mail and even death threats. Since filing his dissertation and beginning his position uh, at the University of Virginia's music department, Carson has released three volumes of a new project entitled Sleepwalking. Among other themes, the series grapples with questions of racism and white supremacy. Uh, volume two, for example, responded directly to the 2017 Summer of Hate in Charlottesville, where he moved immediately before the violence of August 11th and 12th's Unite the Right rally. Uh, on the track, Kill Whitey, Carson declares his right to stand his ground in self-defense uh, and uses both the term Whitey as well as the N-word to refer to white supremacy. And by doing so, Carson's play with language um, asks listeners uh, to reflect on a number of double standards surrounding race, language, and violence. Um, volume three of Sleepwalking, which is subtitled I Used to Love to Dream, is rooted in Carson's um, more recent experiences at UVA, where his teaching responsibilities include running the rap lab, where students can work on writing and recording their own hip hop tracks. Uh, in this album, Carson reflects on his upbringing in Decatur, Illinois, and grapples with some of the lingering regrets he has about leaving uh, his community to join the ranks of academia. He asks listeners to consider his conflicted feelings about being a hip hop professor in a world that continues to treat black folks with hostility. Probing the contradictions of, of being a black artist and scholar in a predominantly white institution. 
Although rendered in deeply personal terms, the questions that Carson grapples with have relevance for all hip hop scholars, especially those of us working in departments of music. As he explains, quote, the title of the series is borrowed from the, uh, the uh, sleepwalking, right? Is, is borrowed from the narrator, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, who in the course of, of accepting his invisible identity observes, quote, you're constantly being bumped up against by those of per, poor vision. Or again, you often doubt if you really exist. Uh, I remember that I'm invisible and walk softly so as not to awaken the sleeping ones. Sometimes it's best not to awaken them. There are few things in this world as dangerous as sleepwalkers." End quote. By being the first person to earn a PhD by writing and recording hip hop music, Carson has already awakened his share of sleepwalkers. As a tenure track assistant professor in music uh, in a music department, he and his colleagues at the University of Virginia are challenging the academic system to accept hip hop music not simply as an object of study, but as creative scholarly labor, which has transformative implications for the institution. I Used to Love to Dream, for example, is published through the University of Michigan Press as, as the first peer reviewed uh, rap album. Those of us who teach and research popular music, especially hip hop, need to ask how often we've taken similar risks. How much space have we created for significant difference in our field? Or have we mostly avoided bumping into our colleagues in ways that might awaken them and upset the status quo? At the same time, Carson deliberately invokes Ellison's words in his liner notes to highlight an uncertainty that he feels about whether he's, he's, he sees himself or others as the sleeping ones. As he pointed out to me when I shared a draft of this lecture, uh, quote, Principally, I think this is important because the narrative of the invisible man is unreliable. I believe I'm likely as unreliable because of the position I now occupy in relation to hip hop. Making music on the tenure track at UVA is a long way from making music on the block back in Decatur for fun or trying to get a record deal or book shows. So those power dynamics, which may be more simply described as economic, can't be ignored." End quote. For non-Black scholars making careers writing and teaching about Black music, these power dynamics are even more salient. Just as Carson recognizes the difference between making hip hop in the academy and making it on the block, uh, musicologists and theorists that write about hip hop need to spend more time thinking about whether our teaching, scholarship, and service uh, commitments can contribute to positive change or simply allow us to get ahead by using Black culture. So some concluding thoughts. Um, the opportunity to bring hip hop into music departments should be a chance to move in new and bold directions. Musicologists and music theorists, especially those of us with tenure, should ask how we can be proactively involved in initiatives that offer more inclusive ideas about what counts as essential knowledge and essential musical practices. It's up to us to question, critique, and find ways to depart from disciplinary norms that silence the voices of the very communities we want to study. At the very least, we should avoid assuming that our work on hip hop is inherently progressive. As members of relatively conservative institutions that remain narrowly fixated on Western classical music, it might be tempting for popular music scholars to imagine themselves as a revolutionary vanguard whose job it is to prove to skeptical colleagues and administrators that hip hop is in fact complex and deserving of academic attention. But the truth is that hip hop has never required our validation nor our attention. What hip hop needs from us is not legitimacy, but action. Restorative justice in music departments means identifying and dismantling disciplinary practices that reinforce and perpetuate racial exclusion. For academic areas like musicology and music theory, this means tearing down and rebuilding a curriculum that has long centered the perspectives of white men. We'll know when we're making progress because our scholarship will engage black voices and abandon race neutral methodologies. We'll know we're making progress when we no longer have all white panels at our conference. And we'll know that we're making progress when music departments stop using black music to increase student enrollments while devoting the lion's share of resources to classical music instructions. And finally, we'll know we're making progress when the lecture slides we created for our hip hop classes in the wake of the Ferguson uprising are no longer so damn relevant. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you, Dr. Lauren Kajikawa. Uh, breathtakingly innovating, extremely interesting and thought provoking 
um, and clearly timely as well as relevant work. Um, G shed as well as the GW community as a whole, thanks you uh, for that conversation and for that presentation. Um, I've got maybe 10,000 questions. <laughs> <laughs> I am a fan of hip hop to the core. Um, most of Jisha will know, even though know, I was born in a Caribbean country, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in East Flatbush, and a lot of my acculturation has to do yeah. with hip hop. I tell people the story that I was listening to Nas's Illmatic before I officially knew how to speak English because Spanish was my first language. And to hear it rectified as far as an intellectual debate um, and uh, an intellectual debate concerning race here, I, I can't do any more than thank you for that. Um, no, let me thanks. Uh, yeah. No, I just want to say like, to like that's, I, that's, I mean, you're just, your your personal like sharing there, um, you know, is one of the things that, like prompted me to to really want to say the things that I said in this talk and in the, in the in the larger article, because like so many of us, especially I mean you know roughly people our our generation, like our whole worldviews, like the way we see the world, the way we understand um, politics, the way we like understand our place in the world, has been shaped profoundly by hip hop artists, right? And and like that's creative and scholarly labor that is often you know it, you know not treated as such, right? Mm -hmm. By by academia. And so I really appreciate that for like what you're saying right off the bat speaks directly to, I think one of the main um, things that I, I'm hoping that we can focus some attention on, which is like really finding ways to, um, you know, honor that work for, 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 for the work that the intellectual labor that it, that it is. No, amen, my brother, amen to that. Uh, as we transition to the audience Q and A, I wanna start off with two questions for you. Uh, first, let me apologize uh, for butchering your last name. It's Kaji Kawa. Uh, yeah. I, I, I apologize for that one because we often tell our students you have the responsibility to learn someone's name. Just because it's hard and not westernized doesn't mean that you can just butcher it. So we're going to practice that. And I'm going to publicly apologize for butchering that earlier. But it leads to uh, my, my 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 question, which is in two parts. Yeah. One yeah. is a personal one, one yeah. is a more intellectual one. Uh, you identified, I never asked you uh, yourself as an, an Asian hip hop scholar. And some people will say your presence in the university alone is a actual symptom of the problem you're describing, right? That right. you're teaching hip hop and you're not a black scholar. Um, at least you don't identify as such. Yeah. What would you say to well-meaning scholars that aren't black want to investigate hip hop in this type of culture and don't know how to position themselves in the work as non-black. How could you, do you have any advice on how to balance that? Are there things you can do when you're not black and you're in a space and you recognize the problems your paper uh, sort of analyze to sort right. of both signal that you are down for the cause, but you aren't part of the problem um, taking someone's seat that needs to be here. That's a personal yeah. question because you talked yeah. about it. The more intellectual question, and I don't know if these are connected, I'll give them to you both so we can get to all your questions sooner, is how do you respond to the other colorblind argument that race doesn't matter? The sort of mm -hmm. what I would call butchering of Martin Luther King's, uh, we all should be judged by the content of our skin, not the content of our character, and say, Lauren, you're the problem because you're making race a problem where it's not, you know, it's just good music. It's just good principles. Yeah. So two questions, one, your positionality, how did you get to the work as a non-black scholar and any advice for other scholars in any field that would wanna do that? And then what is your intellectual response to the race shouldn't matter, therefore it doesn't matter argument? Woo. Two great questions, thank you for those. And I'll do my best to address them you know, directly and you know, uh, as, as concisely as I can, so we have time for, uh, for, for others as well. But uh, you know, I think my own, place in, as a hip hop scholar, you know, um, comes from a pretty non-traditional route as far as music departments go. Um, I, as an undergrad, I was an ethnic studies major um, at UC Berkeley. So I've been concerned with questions of race, power and you know, racial inequality and how we address that um, from going back to my undergraduate you know, career. And, um, you know, as an Asian American, like Japanese American specifically, um, you know, whose like grandparents uh, or great grandparents immigrated to the country to work in under harsh conditions on, you know, sugarcane factories in Hawaii. And like knowing that part of my history, like that was a big part of me understanding my place in the world. And then sort of my responsibilities as well to, 
think about um, you know questions of, of inequality and, and and how we might address them as, as a society. So I got into um, musicology sort of through the side door. Um, you know, I, I wasn't a music major as an undergrad. Most of my colleagues in my field are you know classical classically trained performers. Um, who who have this kind of commitment to classical music and then decide later they want to study the history. And so like, like the fact that I was led into a musicology program was already kind of a step of, of this particular program at UCLA where I got my PhD to broaden the scope of who could be a musicologist, right? So I, I want to acknowledge like that there are people who've been working to open things up. Um, but I also feel like, like as you were pointing out and as I mentioned in my talk, um, I'm also a symptom, like the fact that it's an, you know, an Asian American and not African American. Uh, and, and also, like, I don't identify as a musician, really. So, like, I'm not even like, you know, why, Asian American, African American, like, why not even like, why aren't hip hop artists, right? The ones that are being hired by music departments. Um, like, those, those, those um, inequities exist. And so, I mean, my, the, what I'm trying to do right now, and what I advise other people to do is, you know, if you're going to get into an institution, then there's a responsibility that comes with that privilege, which is to try to open it up for other people and not, you know, take up all the space and um, think that your inclusion, like kind of fool yourself into thinking that your inclusion is itself, um, you know, the progress that we need. And so, um, I mean, I, I mean, I think you could, somebody could say, well, why don't you like resign your position? And, um, you know, that's that, you know, and to, to make space for other folks. Um, I, I actually don't trust that if I were to do that, that the institution would hire the kind of person that I would want to take my place. Um, so, you know, there, there, I think I have some practical concerns about that question, as well as my own financial interest, you know, of, of wanting to have a job to support my family. But I really do think that that once you're in a position, once, especially once scholars have tenure, there is a responsibility to, um, to do the work to attempt to, to transform uh, the institution within which we work um, and to, um, you know, so that it is a place that will take the work of hip hop scholars, the work of African American musicians and, and scholars seriously as music and as music scholarship, so that, you know, the future doesn't look like it looks, uh, you know, like, like it might today. Um, I mean, the question about colorblindness is really a, um, yeah, that's a fundamental question. I mean, I, the best answer I have is go read, you know, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, George Lipsitz, Luke Harris's, and Daniel Martinez Hosang's, you know, Seeing Race Again, Countering Colorblindness Across the Disciplines. Um, but, um, I mean, I think the, the, the proof is, is there and hard to deny, like why we need to talk about race. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I am talking about fairly critically in my, in my article and, and lecture today is that we really have a field that's emerging of hip hop studies within music theory disciplines that consists of white people talking to other white people about and inciting other white people about hip hop. And so if something isn't done, I mean, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to look five, 10 years down the line and imagine a world where like your people are sitting around talking about black music um, and acknowledging that like we ideally we want to have more diversity in our field and in our institutions but you know why i don't know why they can't join or i don't know why they're not a part of it and it's because you know the music is being talked about in ways that are safe i think to uh white folks because they don't have to confront um questions of race and and so i think a lot of the the color blindness and race neutral approach to studying the music um, is because it's safe. It's because it's not controversial. It's because it applies the tools and the approaches to analyzing music that have been cultivated in a very race neutral fashion for, for decades now um, and, and not engaging the work of scholars or even hip hop artists themselves who are demanding that we pay attention to, to racial inequality. So I think, you know, it's the, the answer to that sort of colorblindness question is really one of, of safety and whether scholars are going to be willing to go places that they're not as comfortable about or where other people might be the the voices of authority um and have and have the perspectives that need to be listened to um and then think about how to how their work on hip-hop might need to engage have a responsibility right to engage um those voices yeah, good answer good answer uh, we're going to transition to audience q a now 
The questions are already coming in, which I anticipated with such a thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, we'll try to alternate between oral questions and the written questions as much as we can, and we'll get as many as we can in in the half an hour that we have uh, Dr. Kajikawa. Um, we will start with oral questions. Anyone have any uh, initial questions uh, for Lauren? We have three already in the chat, but I wanted to give uh, the folks, if anyone had any initial questions, anyone was waiting with that uh, burning mute button, uh, you could ask it now. Any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself. I'll go. No one else goes. Dr. Wright? Yes, ma'am. So, okay, Sarah, is that you trying to get in? Uh, I thought I heard Sarah. Julia, go I ahead. Go. I, I don't have to. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Julia. Then we'll try to get it in. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, sorry, Sarah. We started at the same time. Um, for your presentation, um, I, I, I have to leave in a couple of minutes. I just wanted to get this in. Um, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I, I heard kind of two two intersectional kind of themes: the idea of of race and uh, as a theme, and then the legitimization of the study of a topic as a theme, how those intersect. And what I'd like to question is this idea of the um, the legitimization of the topic in terms of systems in higher education. And I think that there are ways to, to subvert some mechanisms that are already in use um, that I could share with you at some point. I think my computer's going off, but. Um, that would be great. I would love to. This idea of scholarship of application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, scholarship of um, Ernest Boyer's work, B-O-Y-E-R. And he's an old white guy. Um, but we could subvert, and I've been using it as a template to kind of subvert the mechanisms within higher education. Great. Um, but I'll reach out to you, so thank you. Yeah, please email me. Um, I would love to, like, um, get more sources or, or thoughts. I mean, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk was to hear from folks in other disciplines about strategies and, and sources that I might want to be, be reading that aren't on my radar. So thanks for that. I mean, and to be clear, Oh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Lauren. You should finish the thought, please. I was just going to say, like, to be clear, like, I'm 100 percent like, like the, the question about legitimacy, like trying to like feeling like our job is to legitimize hip hop through our scholarship is like not the question to be or not, not the mission to be on or not the, the, you know, is hip hop legitimate is not a question that really needs to be asked. Right. You know, people treat it as music. It's I mean, it, that's a question that hip hop artists and hip hop fans don't even ask themselves, you know, um, so I really don't think. Um, yeah, I just, I think that it's, uh, it's something that happens, right? Things become regarded as legitimate and they, they stop being questioned, but I certainly don't think the role of hip hop scholars, um, should be one of, of legitimation. Um, hi, this is, um, Leslie Ward. I did my dissertation on hip hop cultural competence here at G shed. Um, and to piggyback off what Julia said in K 12. When you deal with the hip hop culture, which I think is the predominant culture of urban students, you run up against the, the deficiency model. Yes. Where yes. Even black educators feel like that's a deficient culture, so they don't incorporate it into the curriculum. So I don't know if you spoke about that, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on the deficiency model. Right. And I think, like, opposed to that, I mean, I'm, I'm still just, I feel like I'm in the deep end with with all of you folks who have really you know strong backgrounds in education um but it, like i know i am aware of like um is it like culturally responsive approaches to pedagogy right that are that are kind of in contrast to deficiency models right where it's not not assuming that like we need to give these people but rather we actually need to um you know meet people where they are and realize that they already have um you know, strategies for, you know, dealing with the world and, and learning that, that if we're more uh, able to, to tap into, right, um, 
you know, we'll, we'll have better results. And so um, that's, that's something that I still need to read up more on. Um, but I do, I, I think that that's, that's really important. There's a, an African-American um, uh, musician and administrator uh, who, t who is in DEI at the Oberlin Conservatory in Ohio um, mm. uh, named Christopher Jenkins. And he and I have been uh, in conversation and collaborating. And so uh, Chris Jenkins has really been pushing forward this idea of culturally responsive, um, you know, not only education, but how can we even incorporate this into um, the world of, of classical music performance and um, just, just like kind of critiquing just how white and hostile a lot of, you know, these spaces can be. Um, and, and so he has this concept of what he calls racialized aesthetics, um, where like blackness is really like the way, from everything, the way how people dress, talk, and, and just how unwelcome that is in sort of white cultural spaces. And so um, I, I would definitely give him a shout out and he's, he's really working on that at the conservatory level. But yeah, I think like K through, like I'm sure that he'd be interested in connections to K through 12 education because conservatories only get their students through, you know, um, through K through 12. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I just want to go to one of the first written questions. We have several written questions. We're going to get uh, hopefully to as many of them as possible. The first and if I don't get to them, if I can get a copy of them, I can definitely email or, or you know, send them by afterwards if we don't have time. Yeah. No problem. And I've already put your email um, in the chat. Uh, so we can expect some people to contact you and follow up on this great presentation. Uh, the question is hip hop, if taught at all, is taught uh, is not taught any differently from anything else uh, to me because like, academia in general is based upon white history. How can we change uh, how hip hop is taught without changing academia in general? Uh, I don't, yeah, great question. I would say, yeah, you have to, I think like hip hop is an opportunity to change academia, right? It's not just a, an opportunity to add something to the list of things that we already teach but an opportunity to rethink like what our mission is here um and that's why i mean it, it happens pretty quickly in the talk but i did i, I cited the work of uh, shannon dudley who is an ethnomusicologist at university of washington and he's worked on bringing um puerto rican bomba music um you know into the academic settings and like you know his point is that like yeah bomba is a chance to do some do things differently right you like the the, the academia is set up to kind of separate history from performance, from theory, you have these like separate classes and that, that are very individualistic. Um, and bomba, just like hip hop, is an interdisciplinary art form. I know there's another question in the chat about like how we define the scope of hip hop. And I think, you know, even if we take, you know, one of the, the often repeated definitions of hip hop culture as, you know, the combination of, you know, graffiti art, uh, DJing, MCing, and, and dance, right? B-boying or B-girling, like the kind of four elements definition of hip hop. I mean, I think we can think about bigger, but some people say, you know, KRS one says knowledge is the fifth element. Um, some people want to put beatboxing in as the sixth element. Um, we can have it, but, but no matter how many elements there are, the point is, is that hip hop is interdisciplinary, right? The culture is inter interdisciplinary. A lot of DJs, you know, have some experience dancing. A, a lot of dancers MC. Um, th there's a kind of, and then there's ways in which all these artists work together, even if they only do one of the elements, you know, they work together with one another. And I think our, thinking about how our academic disciplines, like dance is often very separate from music, right? Um, visual art is often separated from both dance and music, you know? And so when I look at, I'm music at, at GW is in the Corcoran School of the Arts and Design. And we have these conversations regularly about how can we be more interdisciplinary? How can faculty and students collaborate more? And I think like, well, here is hip hop, which is a, you know, well, maybe hip hop artists can lead the way because they've been collaborating uh, and working together, you know, for, for decades. And, you know, you can't really think about hip hop music as separate from, from dance, right? You can't think about emceeing, you know, uh, as, as separate from DJing. We have to really think about the relationship between, you know, these elements. And so, um, in, in a lot of ways, this is just one example, but in a lot of ways, I think hip hop should be uh, an opportunity to rethink how, how things are done um, in, in lots of different ways, but that's just, that's just one. Good answer, good answer. I'm gonna do one more comment and then we're gonna go back to our oral questions. And this comment is as follows. 
Uh, and I'll read it verbatim. My goodness, this is so enlightening. It is a problem for how one can move an entire musical culture at universities. There is so much in hip hop to discover and uncover. What is wrong with engaging whites in understanding the message that come from hip hop that present a reality that the mainstream whites are perhaps ignorant, I'll add the word of. What can you do in your own context to begin change that you see needs happening in the realm of music scholarship? Yeah, um, again, another good question. I mean, I think that is in many ways, the, if I understand the, the question correctly, um, I mean, I think that's why a lot of people like me um, who want to talk not just about like the inner workings of the music, but want to talk about how it connects to politics, you know, society, history, got into it or so interested in, in writing and researching about hip hop because it is such a powerful vehicle for shaping how people see the world, how they experience the world, how they understand the world. Uh, to give you a concrete example, something that I do um, in my classes when I teach about hip hop is think about the history and politics of you know the war on drugs right in the 1980s and 1990s and the rise of mass incarceration i have students watch you know ava duvernay's excellent documentary 13th um and have them really think about the history and the, and the politics that led to the united states having the, the largest population of incarcerated individuals in in the world um and who are completely that population which is also you know, majority or, or overrepresented by African Americans and and people who are in jail for imprisoned for nonviolent drug crimes, right? Because of drug laws and and and, and policing practices. So that's a whole world of um, that. That's an issue that's become much more salient recently in in politics, right? You even have um, a kind of bipartisan agreement, you know, consensus that's emerging that we need to reform drug laws and 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 that mass incarceration isn't the way to go. You know, after we're like three decades into into that, um, but or maybe four decades into that. Um, but the point that I make is that you know, hip hop. If you if you listen to hip hop from the '80s through the '90s, um, you know, hip hop was the one space where people and you know were calling. We're calling attention to the to these issues, to these realities, and if we had been listening and paying attention, you know, uh, rather than sort of dismissing those voices, um, maybe we could have got to a place where, you know, it's not 2020 and we're finally saying we need to do something about this issue, right? And and the kind of kinder, gentler, kind of human face that some many politicians have tried to put on the opioid, the current opioid crisis, for example, like hip hop was one of the only places in the 80s and 90s where there was a human face put on what was happening, you know, with crack and, and, and sort of over policing of, of black and brown communities. Um, like those were conversations where there was a human face and, and, and a human and, and, and um, you know, people were trying to shift how folks thought about those issues. And I think a lot of people heard that, but um, uh, yeah, so I think that like, absolutely what, what that comment said was there are lots of examples of, of stuff like that, where we can look at, at what the music and the musicians are saying um, as an opportunity to, um, you know, introduce voices and 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 perspectives that aren't getting heard and need to be heard um, in in uh, institutions uh, of power. Lauren, that is a wonderful answer. I hope they tape this. <laughs> that was really good. Uh, this is Patricia Tate. I'm in the uh, School of Education in the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy, and also I'm an executive director of the Office of Professional Preparation and Accreditation. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're preparing teachers, you know, for yeah. culturally responsive teaching and all that you're talking about. And uh, I think there's a there's a connection here that a stronger connection that we may be able, uh, hopefully through Dwayne's leadership to make uh, with you. So I yeah. really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. And thanks for attending. And I do hope that there are more opportunities for yeah, for all of us to talk and work together. So, so, so Lauren, uh, th thank you, Dr. Tate. Uh, we appreciate that. And hopefully, Lauren, please do work with me uh, to reconnect with anyone that um, offers for that connection, and we'll definitely make it happen. Um, in in hip hop, we usually have, uh, for those of you who don't know, a top five that are alive. Uh, we usually use that for greatest rappers. Mine goes Biggie, uh, Tupac, Outkast, um, Eminem, and Lil Wayne. And you know, this, 
an argument that will go on for uh, many times. Why don't we get your top five dead alive? But I don't want greatest rappers. The question was, what books uh, yeah. are good to learn about hip hop history? Why don't you give us three for those that might be new to hip hop of when it, of any race? And maybe two for those who are solid hip hop heads like you, I, Dr. Ward, and others. Uh, five books. Such a great question. The first three are super easy for me. Uh, Trisha Rose, who I already mentioned, Trisha Rose, Black Noise, right? Uh, Rap Music and Black Culture in Contemporary America. That book was published in 1994, and it is still, in my mind, the best book ever written about hip hop, uh, at least from an academic you know, writer. Um, and I don't know how many folks are aware of, you know, Dr. Rose, who has continued to, she's written other things about hip hop, but she's also just uh, a brilliant um, scholar with, um, you know, a sharp moral compass. Uh, she has a current, currently has a podcast with uh, Dr. Cornell uh, West um, called, what's it called? Somebody probably out there in this, in the, in this audience knows. Um, the con it's, like not the, it's not the conversation, it's, it's something else. But if you just Google Trisha Rose, Cornell West, like podcast, um, and they have great, great guests on all the time. So Trisha Rose would be number one. Uh, I probably put Jeff Chang, uh, who wrote uh, "Can't Stop, Won't Stop: The History of, of the Hip Hop Generation," um, which you know includes a lot of um, you know oral history and, and interviews that that Chang did with um, folks who were there from in the Bronx in the 1970s, 80s, um, and then you know um, kind of doesn't. It's, it's a book that talks about not just the music but about the culture and politics. Uh, oh yeah, the tightrope. Thanks, thank you, Meg Holland. For that it's called the tightrope with, with trisha rose and, and cornell west um so yeah jeff chang's can't stop won't stop would be number two and then i would say just representing the music music scholars my favorite music scholar that's written about hip-hop is an ethnomusicologist named joe schloss who's based in in brooklyn new york um and um uh so joe schloss s c h l o s s he's written two books about hip-hop that are both i think among the best things written um, by, by hip hop scholars. One's called Making Beats, um, the Art of Sample Based Hip Hop. So that's if you're interested in, you know, what producers do when they make when they make beats using samples um, and its relationship to like, you know, foundational DJ practices. Like basically, how do you get from DJs who are playing records at parties in the 70s to the work of digital? Like, what are the links between that and, and how producers throughout the 80s and 90s worked with 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 uh, samples to make beats. And then his second book uh, was called Foundation, which Foundation is about b-boying and b-girling in New York City. Um, and and I think, B, I would say like for this audience, check, I, I would even recommend checking out Foundation um, about b-boying and b-girling because a lot of the focus of that book is on pedagogy and, and the way in which older dancers mentor and teach, right? Younger dancers. And the thing that I, um, the thing that I love about Joe Schloss's work, both in both books, is that rather than kind of inventing his own theories and like, or, or taking models from, um, you know, musicology, music theory, and, and ethnomusicology and applying them to hip hop, like how does hip hop exemplify these things that academics already know or talk about? Schloss's work is about interviewing and talking and, and being embedded as a participant observer in hip hop communities, uh, you know, talking to producers, talking to dancers. And through talking to them and asking them questions and getting to know their work and, 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 and how they do what they do and how they teach and how they learn, um, he, he tries to make the theories that are already within the culture and the pedagogies that are already within the culture legible to, an, act, to a, an, an audience of outsiders. So, which is to say, like, it's a way of acknowledging, like, in contrast to the deficiency model, right? It's a way of acknowledging that theory music theory already exists in hip hop, right? Everything, you know, you can't, uh, there's a, there's a music, musicologist that said, you know, everything has theory. Like you can't, one can't use the bathroom without theory, you know, like, like theory is embedded in, in everything that we do. And so hip hop has theory. It might not be bracketed off, isolated and discussed, you know, explicitly as such, like the way that it is in, in Western music theory, but um, it's embedded in, in, in the practice. And so the work of folks like Schloss have really done a lot to um, remind us of that and I think might be a way of leading us towards what incorporating hip hop into the academy would look like for, and all versus like what it, what I don't think it should look like. I know, uh, yeah, Leslie Ward, um, I do know of Professor Emden, but not, but I don't, 
uh, know him personally, but but yes. Yeah, we should probably get uh, either next year or a few of you back on a panel, maybe have a half a day symposium. These issues are timely and I see the interdisciplinary connections to expand on this conversation, both at the critical mass at your school and ours. Uh, let's go back to our live audience. I have another comment that I want to read, but I don't want to neglect those that took the time out today. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, are there any further questions uh, for Lauren uh, before I read this comment? Yes, Dr. Wright. Um, this is uh, Mary Kay Vona. I'm a GSHED alumni um, in the uh, doctoral LOP program in, in leadership. So the closest that I've had to musicology is I play piano for 13 years and I do teach hip hop <laughs> dance. So um, on the side, which is the genesis of my question, um, uh, Lauren, your pr presentation and discussion was phenomenal. Um, my, my question is, does the research or has there been any type of research that's looked at actually hip hop dance and are your findings similar from core music to actual hip hop dance? That's a great question. I'm, I mean, I already mentioned Joe Schloss's research and book on, on hip hop dance, but in terms of like how it's been taught and how it's been incorporated mm -hmm. into academia, I, I'm not aware, but that's a great, I think that's a great question and one that I, I should follow up on. Um, I know that, yeah, and there's also, you know, I should also say that there's this body of knowledge in um, education, which I'm like, I, I'm just starting to like become more aware of and, and thinking about engaging because there is like a lot of hip hop scholarship um, in education, right, which is sometimes okay. also cut off from music or other, you know, interdisciplinary conversations about hip hop. So there's, I think we really do need to, to kind of get it together, <laughs> you know, across the disciplines. Um, and yeah, maybe that's actually a good idea even for a, a volume, like an interdisciplinary <laughs> You know, hip hop, a, a volume on hip hop studies that, that's truly interdisciplinary. Um, I, I can think of things that are more from one or one or one or the other in terms of disciplinary approaches and backgrounds. But um, there's work being done right in in just about every unit on campus that engages mm -hmm. hip hop in some way. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not aware. But if you come across anything, please let me know. Yeah, I will. Yeah. I definitely will. I, my curiosity has peaked. And talk about intersectionality, especially when you talk about dance and you know, core yeah. music and actual rapping. Um, so yes, I definitely will. But thank you so much. And thank you again for coordinating this, Dr. Wright. Oh, no, thank you, Mary, for joining us. Our alumni are a bloodline. We're so proud of you. And thank you for uh, the work that you do. It's really important. Um, thank you. Uh, I got a comment here uh, as my audience uh, thinks about their further comments and questions. Uh, it, it, it goes as follows. Your comment around gatekeepers was particularly powerful for me and pushed me to reflect as a white person. What advice do you have for someone who has, had, who has a positional authority to advocate for changes in music educational practices, i.e. recognize the cultural intellectual importance of predominantly black genres? How do we do this work meaningfully? That's such a great question and such an important question. I think Langston Colin Wilkins, who um, you know, is a Houston-based folklorist and, and hip-hop scholar, um, whose work you should definitely check out. Um, you know, I think his his critique offers some suggestions that are worth considering. Um, I mean, I think the thing that really resonates with me, and that's I think a real challenge, not just in music, but just across GW. I hear people talk about this with in GW broadly, is you know our relationship to the city of DC, right? I mean, we here we are in so-called Chocolate City, or or what or what's left of of Chocolate City. Um, you know, with respect to you know gentrification of the past past couple of decades, um, and you know that that so so Wilkins, you know, his statement about it's always about bringing the margins to the mainstream because the mainstream won't go to the margins. I, I really think there is work to be done with respect to you know we think about our. I mean, one of the things that people love about GW is its location here in Washington D.C that we're close to the White House and, and, the, and you know, the, the National Mall and all these institutions and museums and the kind of internships that our students can have. But, um, you know, we also have a really rich, uh, rich communities in DC, um, African American with, you know, rich African American history, culture, including music, art, um, literature, and, you know, just, just like to what extent are we um, really engaging that? You know, and and so I think that that there a lot of this has to do with whether, you know, we're kind of taking things and bringing them into our campus environment or are we 
really finding ways to have partnerships that benefit and bring people from GW to, you know, the so-called margins versus sort of, you know, hogging everything and, um, and, and having it just be isolated in the sort of safe space of, of Foggy Bottom as a campus. So I think that's one thing, that, that a question that we need to be asking and partnerships that we need to be looking for. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I'll leave it at that for now, but there's like, I, I really think like looking back at what, what, what Langston is saying there is, is really key. Um, I think uh, I'll say one more thing, which is within music specifically, you know, we have um, a track record of, we're, we're really small, like liberal arts department or program um, it, within the university, people don't come to GW to major in music, right? You go to Oberlin or Juilliard um, or, you know, sort of bigger school of music conservatories, if, if that's like your main thing. What I, but um, so we have uh, the, the majority of our majors um, are double, double majors, right? They come here to do other things and then music is a part that sustains them. And so we hire, we have a relatively small full-time faculty, but we hire part-time faculty who teach with the, um, you know, who teach, I mean, not who teach, to teach in our department that, that play with, you know, the National Symphony, or they may even commute from, from other places and, you know, have, have careers doing what they do. So, so, you know, why don't we have partnerships or spaces for, um, you know, hip hop artists in the, in the DC or, or just like, you know, relatively local community, Baltimore, other Virginia, uh, neighboring, neighboring areas, um, where we can hire folks from the community and actually pay them to work with our students. Uh, in the same way that we've been doing for decades uh, for classical music performance. So I think there, there, those things are like very immediate. And then I think there are also um, things that we can do. And then there are also like larger long-term partnerships that we can be looking for. Mm -hmm. We're coming up to the end here, folks. I'm trying to get as many questions in as we can. Uh, I, I like this question because it's a tough question and it's typical of the ones you'll get here at GSHED, but it's an intellectually curious one. Why should hip hop culture want to be aligned with intellectual structures that have historic have not historically loved or honored our culture, our stories, or our lives? So this is kind of the master's tools and then this mantle the master's house question. Uh, how would you respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great point. And I would say that in a lot of cases, hip hop doesn't or probably shouldn't. You know, like if I mean, hip hop artists, uh, a lot of them are skeptical of the value or, or, you know, what they might get out of a partnership with, uh, with institutions, because they're aware that those institutions have, you know, by design, um, excluded, you know, have been anti-black, right, to be frank, you know, and so why go somewhere where, um, you know, you're not wanted and, and the interactions are, you know, um, problematic in, in a variety of ways. I think that there's good cause for skepticism. Um, the reasons perhaps to overcome, try to overcome that skepticism are that there really isn't a neat divide between the hip hop community and academia. Um, you know, Dr. Wright, you're an example of that from your, your, like your, your initial statement or disclosure about your own history. Um, you know, we're, we overlap, right? Um, those of us that feel very connected to, um, you know, musical practices, uh, or, or uh, different cultural practices, different ways of seeing the world that are that are a part of hip hop are in university spaces already, right? There are already hip hop musicians on campus doing incredible work. Uh, they might not be officially associated with with the Department of Music right now, but they're here, you know. So um, the reason to get involved is is to sort of um, I think to have a more honest and um, rich like like world because because those worlds already overlap in ways and so i think if it's done in the right way by the right people um you know we can maybe transform and make you know open up spaces on campus that aren't hostile to to black people and black culture in the same way that um you know they have been so we have a final question before i turn it over to dr kajikawa for closing statements I want to thank my audience, thank everyone that came out here. And then Lauren, I especially want to thank you for this one little presentation, extremely thought provoking, uh, some of the most engaging Q&A we've had at our programs here all year at GSHED. So I thank you for that. Uh, final question comes from the audience and it's, uh, I'll read it again uh, verbatim. Music, because it uses text and music slash sound, engages both the reading and sensual capacities of the audience. Can hip hop scholarship influence academia's culture of prioritizing language 
over sensual experience? Oh, wow. I love that question. Um, I mean, I believe it can. Um, I'm not going to be able to give you the perfect answer about how to do that. But um, I mean, I will. I'll, okay, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't like said anything about my own scholarship um, so much in this talk, but I, the book that I, that I published in 2015 is called Sounding Race in Rap Songs. And that book was an effort to argue that the way we think about identity in hip hop isn't shaped just by the imagery we see in music videos or the lyrics that, you know, the, the, the sort of semantic meaning of lyrics, but that a lot of what we, how, how artists project their identities um, and d distinguish themselves has to do with the beats of the music, the music that they're rhyming over. And like, as, as this question is alluding to, the sort of central experience of, of sound, right? And so um, that's something that I firmly believe is true, that we're learning and, and absorbing information and engaging with ideas through our bodies, right? Not just through, um, you know, uh, sort of text, you know, and, and, and language. And so, yes, I think, I think that's, that should be an important part of, of, of our conversation. And um, there are scholars in music, uh, not necessarily in hip hop, who are trying to talk about that, this idea of embodied cognition, you know, this idea that like concepts aren't just abstract mental things, but they're things that we experience with our body. And, you know, and I think music and sound is one of those things. Um, and so I think there's really room for, for that. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, but absolutely. So we're right at 1.30 and I wanna always respect my audience time. You can be anywhere in the world, particularly in COVID through your computer and you're here with me. And I really appreciate that. Uh, Lauren, any final comments before we end off? Uh, and I would particularly want you, if you could, to gear your final comments towards this. We at G said, teach counselors, teachers, um almost on a daily basis definitely on a year by year we're producing what do we need to know what nuggets do your work have for those that are going to be teaching teachers particularly music teachers that you would like to leave the audience with well first i just want to say thank you to you um, for the invitation to speak here today um as well as to every single person who you know helped make this possible and showed up today uh, including those who showed up today to, to be a part of this, because if it was just me talking into my computer, uh, it wouldn't have been much of an event. Uh, so thanks to all of you and, and for all of your questions and comments. Um, I've, I've learned a lot today. Um, I, I don't know what pearls of wisdom I have, except to say that I think we can all sort of, uh, you know, go back to whether it's hip hop for you. I mean, it is for, it may be for me or for other people here, but whatever it is that really, um, you know, mo has motivated you to learn or to question things about the world that you live in, the, you know, the, the, the role of the arts, the role of music and other art forms in our society, um, I think it's in this time of economic, you know, challenges and precarity and the challenge of, challenges of COVID, it can be tempting to think like what we need are X, Y, and Z kind of material resources, which as important as those things are, um, there is an important place for the arts because that that is the, like where the power to imagine, uh, you know, a different world to sort of create um, ideas and experiences of what the other other possible worlds could feel like. You know, how do we know what freedom could feel like if we're if we're not free? A lot of that has been through music and other artistic practices. And so I think like the, all I could say closing this out is that um, even in the most challenging and, and dire times, uh, the arts are, are an important part of the struggle for a better future. Thank you, Dr. Lauren Kajikawa. Thank you for this marvelous presentation. Um, thank you to my audience. Thank you to our wonderful GSET staff, uh, Meg, Tehran, um, and Victoria for making this happening. Uh, this has truly been wonderful. I have already gotten no less than three texts from people about why Jay-Z was not in my top five artists and I'm from Brooklyn. So that and other conversation, I'm sure will continue past this. And that is always our goal here at G-Shed. Uh, on all serious note, not to have these conversations end here, but continue throughout. Um, and hopefully that will be the case.
Uh, all right. Thank you, everyone. We'll be back in January. Stay tuned for more information on our uh, inaugural Martin Luther King Lecture Series in partnership with our Multicultural Student Service Center, which will be coming out in January and other events that we will have uh, an initiative through GSHED. Uh, thank everyone for joining us. Uh, please have a wonderful afternoon. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.